welcome to the Townsend Center. Uh, we're pleased to host uh, Dana Funahasi, a uh, professor in the Department of Anthropology, who's trained as a sociocultural linguistic. Uh, so, so called, see, I just made you. <laughs> I'm over into uh, literary folk. Uh, a sociocultural anthropologist, uh, Dana's work examines the force of speechlessness, the uncanny, and what lies in the shadow of what can be named. She joins us to discuss her recent book, Untimely Sacrifices, Work and Death in Finland. Um, and uh, our colleague uh, from English, my colleague from English, Dan Blanton, will be joining Dana for today's discussion. A few events uh, to note, um, uh, some more uh, imminent than others. Um, the Townsend Center is delighted to host Daphne Brooks, the William R. Keenan Professor of African American Studies, Music, and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Yale, and the author of Liner Notes for the Revolution, The Intellectual Life of Black Feminist Sound. Daphne's lecture, Rhapsody and Ruin, Porgy and Bess and the Story of America is the first in our Life of Sound series of public lectures. Um, the series runs parallel to uh, Townsend Center collaborative research seminar of the same title. And future speakers in that series will be uh, the novelist Valeria Luiselli and the artist and choreographer Tanya Lukin Linklater. Um, so consult our website for details about those events. Next Tuesday, we will be hosting Kevin McLaughlin, the George Hazard Crooker Professor of English, Comparative Literature and German Studies at Brown. Kevin's talk, Gehalt Theory, Benjamin on Goethe, is co-sponsored with the Department of German and the Program in Critical Theory. That talk will take place in this room at five o'clock on Tuesday, October 24th. And then finally, our next book chat will take place on Wednesday, November 1st, when we'll be joined by Kevis Goodman, um, a colleague of um, in the Department of English to discuss her new book, Pathologies of Motion, Historical Thinking in Medicine, Aesthetics and Poetics. So uh, that's it, it's a busy, a busy calendar um, uh, for the month, the rest of October and November. Uh, um, but without further ado, uh, I yield the floor to you, Dan and Dana. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Um, everyone, everyone, I think should, we were just discussing the sort of cover of, uh, of the sort of wonderfully timely, despite its title, um, book on timely sacrifices, work and death in Finland, uh, with its image of a sculptural monument of three smiths in Helsinki. Uh, it is probably inevitable. I noticed that at least one of the blurbs on the on the back of the volume has done the same. Um, to think of this as a timely uh, work, timely enough that I have begun to suspect over the last couple of weeks, the copies of it should be sent to every administrator at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, untimely sacrifices, work and death in Finland. Um, a remarkable piece of what I would think of as a kind of experimental anthropology, uh, but also also a kind of uh, cultural temperature taking um, of the last few decades, perhaps uh, provocative of a more general set of thoughts even beyond Finland. Um, we can perhaps begin, we can perhaps get to what makes this thought untimely and what entails us in ultimately a logic of sacrifice. Uh, but I want to invite Dana first uh, to begin with really the problem at the center of the book, um, which is that that we've all encountered probably vicariously or directly of burnout, um, and to invite her to, uh, to, to give us some coordinates and explain the particular, the particular emergence uh, and unfolding of the thought and problem of burnout in Finland over the last couple of decades. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Stephen, for hosting this wonderful setup. I love this book chat format. And thank you, Dan, for <laughs> engaging with my work and reading this book. So um, coordinates, right? How did burnout become a matter of national concern in Finland? And why did it take this temporal temporalized element, let's say. So I want to start with um, 
the early 2000s. That's when I started fieldwork in Helsinki. And at that time, Finland had just come out of a pretty bad economic recession, one bad enough to kind of generate a national soul searching. Why did, why was it so bad? Why were we put under so much pressure when, for instance, neighboring Sweden did not go through the same kind of economic crisis that we did? So this we against them, what is wrong with us discourse kind of set in. And in this moment of self or well, national self-reflection, um, experts start, started wondering what it is that set us back. What is this that is, that is keeping us from being timely, that is timely, efficient, competitive in the here and now. And so timeliness, took on the quality of being competitive and uh, and yeah being being at one with what is happening and not being so efficient and not doing so well took on the qualities of well you're you're operating within the mechanics of what worked in the past and that past mechanics the past ethos of work the ethics of work must somehow be rejected and it was very explicitly said as a, a need for rejection. There was a push for that. And this new e economy, what came to be known as the new economy came to be adopted precisely at that moment of national self-reflection. And it was also interesting at this point that burnout became an issue <laughs> in the national um, work-life surveys citizen workers started complaining about the pressure of work, the, the fastness of work, the demands that are changing and how the social contract of work has also changed. Um, and that's also when Finnish health experts recognized or identified burnout as the new hazard of the new economy and how using that discourse of timeliness that the economic experts put forward, they also used it to say, well, those not keeping up with the demands of the times must be those maladapted to the present economic imperatives. And those individuals who fall prey to burnout must then be individuals who must be made timely. These are individuals who have failed to gain timely, you know, who, uh, who fail to be current and for them to gain currency in the here and now, they must be disciplined. They must be rehabilitated. They must be allowed to own what they're doing and come out of the shadow of being a figure of history, right? They must not just become products of the past of welfare, but they must become the present workers of today. And that's how this kind of- So drill in on that phenomenon a little bit, the yeah. sort of descriptive effect. Mm -hmm. of, of burnout because in a way of course we're talking about too much work and too much stress and, yeah. and just you know a kind of a kind of industrial or post-industrial grinding down of, of yeah. labor but there's something else here that that you're you're getting to and that, that seems to emerge in the Finnish case in particular which isn't just overwork there's another part of it that kind of marks it as the particular phenomenon of burnout yeah, thank you very much for that. Yeah, so burnout is commonly mistaken as a problem that comes from working too much. It's, it, it isn't. What Finnish health experts identified as the key characteristic of burnout is this. It's not the quantity of work, it's the quality of work. Quality of, well, do you feel recognized at work? Do people recognize when you sacrifice yourself? Do you when you volunteer for things, when you offer to teach someone something, when you offer to give more of your time for something, right? It's when it's the buildup of that frustration that happens when you, your efforts, your sacrifices don't get recognized. So burnout, you burn out when your sacrifices go unrecognized. So it makes for, so burnout makes for a great kind of category, a notion, a concept through which to, to kind of further unpack the notion of economy and non-contracted non aspects of exchange that labor encompasses. It's not just what is contracted, 
but it's also very much how you're generous, right? <laughs> Your generosity is very much what labor wants. So the historical scene then that we have here is rather singular. Um, Finland, a kind of marketish economy, um, partial market economy in the, the usual uh, sense, um, part of course, of the sort of Scandinavian, um, a variation on Scandinavian social democracy, uh, but on the fringes or margins of Europe. Uh, and also, of course, under the shadow of the uh, formerly the Soviet Union, and through the '90s, the sort of the sort of Russia and the Eastern Eastern Europe that emerges from the post 1991 collapse. So, talk to me about the kinds of economies uh, that are at stake. What is the old sort of Finnish economy, and what emerges in its place? Uh, and describe the sort of difference in the terms you just used uh, of those. Yeah, so um, Nordic welfare in Finland uh, developed in the late 70s. Well, it was already developing post-World War II, but it really gained its momentum in the 70s. And it, the, the ideal of Nordic welfare, a la Finland, was to universalize uh, employment, right? Employment is a human right. It's not something that you should compete for, you should fight for, you should, you should have that right as a basic right because it leads to your economic and personal independence and value. Um, and it was also a vehicle through which you could become a valuable contributor to the virtuous cycle, the virtuous circle that Nordic welfare is so famous for. So the way you would bargain, let's say, for industry would be very collective. As an industry, you would fight together to say, hey, we want you know, better wages, <laughs> or we want I don't know, better aeration in the rooms or something like that. But post um, this economic crisis and post implementation of what came to be known as the new economy, um, this kind of collective bargaining um, practices got kind of uh, restructured, let's put it that way. And it, it became more of a matter for individual independent sectors to put together on their own. So on one side, we have a kind of, a kind of Nordic style social welfare state. Right. And we have approaching something that is sort of more familiar and more recognizable in America and North terms of the European Union or something like that. So you've, you've gestured for the different notions of economy there. Right. But the crucial, the crucial insight in a way seems to have to do with the sort of movement from one to the other and the discovery that in fact, we don't just have two different economic models, right. but two different ideas of economy. Exactly, definitely. So ju just, to, just to be clear, I'm not saying that post-economic crisis, Finland became like us, right? Mm -hmm. No, Finland is still staunchly a Nordic welfare state and their welfare system definitely works much better than what you can even say we have. They have one. Yeah, they have one. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's alive, it's there. So that's definitely not what I am saying. I'm, I'm trying to say that certain things were recalibrated and this recalibration gave rise to a certain difference in the timber of social relationality at the workplace. So these slight changes cause, let's say, rife between colleagues where before, you know, because you bargain collectively, you wouldn't feel competitive towards your colleagues. But now maybe because you're competing more on an individual basis and fighting for the right to have a job, you might feel a bit more like, hmm. <laughs> right? So that, that's the qualitative difference that, that came out. But on a more structural, systematic level, Finland does have a robust welfare model. Um, but so talking about these qualitative differences that I found in my ethnographic fieldwork, um, I can say that it affects how you give yourself, right? How you want to volunteer for things <laughs> and what then happens when you volunteer your time. 
is it that people will recognize the sacrifice and say, well, thank you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't have to come in. That's an empirical <laughs> matter, no. <laughs> right, or would they say, well, we're all competing for recognition. So this is your attempt to, to get ahead. This is you, you know, putting a notch on your belt saying, hey, I'm, I'm trying to get ahead. <laughs> this is part of your strategy. We like to talk about strategic plans. Okay, so this is your strategic plan for your career. Why would I then recognize that as any kind of a gift? So what was seen as kind of a moral economy of, of, uh, of giving and wanting to give for the sake of commun you know, communal, for the sake of the communal spirit, right? To, to be part of this work community, that, somehow shifted and morphed into, well, what is it really that you're doing? Are you trying to claim that you did this so you're going to get ahead? That kind of suspicion crept into that relationality um, at work and and that caused some kind of attention. And that's what I'm trying to base as the grounds we're talking about for an out. Not that you know people are working or they're not, there are laws. Re regulating how long you can work in film. Yeah, I expect the anthropologists in the room will have heard the echo of Marcel Mauss in, in some of this, but for the non-anthropologists in the room, um, maybe, maybe you can sort of develop this idea of a gift economy, um, a sort of moral economy, um, an economy, a general economy, I suppose, uh, that turns out to be recognizable only once we begin to lose it. Um, and, well, I'll just <laughs> leave it there. <laughs> well, most call the gift, well, it's it's going to be difficult to kind of squeeze <laughs> in that. And I hate, I hate to put myself in that position, but I will, I can say this. It is a, he would call it a total social fact, right? To give someone to you know, give something to someone and have that recognized and have this event or this exchange meet its full completion, we both would have to be in the same matrix, same cultural, social, ethical, religious, I don't know, whatever. But you, you would have to think about, okay, so what is the quality of this gift that Dan gave me, right? Is it uh, equal to his social background? Is it, uh, is it a respectable gift? Is it a valuable gift? Like, is this a, a gag gift, right? That has to be judged or gauged based on his, my guess of his socioeconomic background, maybe. Um, even if you were not so discerning of, oh, is this gift valuable? You might still think, okay, what is then required of, of me? What, what does this giving and receiving generate? What does it animate, right? And that animation required, the, and, the, and the response would have to be in a way, given in a way that is recognizable to, to the other person I, I might be giving the gift. Um, another point that most makes besides giving, receiving, and reciprocating gifts would be that gifts don't happen within a dyadic relationship it, it's always a triad the gift comes from somewhere you got it from somewhere someone else I might get it from you but I will give it to someone else so Moses huge point um, and contribution to anthropological thinking about exchange is that the force that drives gifts is a, uh, the force that drives the gift is a social force it has a social domicile it's the force of our ideals that make us, he would, he would say, um, give, give, receive, and <laughs> reciprocate, yeah, right? So he's very much into understanding why people would be moved to do something against their self-interest. And his answer to that question is, well, it's society. Society moves us in a way that makes us think more ethically or in a way that is bigger than ourselves, right? Yeah. To think more socially, how is it that we can come together when we are here and born as individuals, maybe? So in a way, this is slightly reductive perhaps, but one way to understand the phenomenon or the, the effect of burnout, um, quite aside from 
mental health or psychological or other other descriptions um, would simply lie in this discovery of the disparity or the gap between an economy of exchange based on contracts and an economy of exchange based on gifts. Mm -hmm. How generalizable is that thought? Is this just Finland? <laughs> That's a slightly leading question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think burnout is, <laughs> is definitely a worldwide phenomenon. But some some might ask, is burnout even a, a real thing? For instance, the World Health Organization has ranked down burnout. Mm -hmm. uh, even when it was first recorded, it was not even considered a primary diagnosis, mm -hmm. a pri primary disease diagnosis. But now it's even ranked down to just a, I wouldn't say just, but a occupational phenomenon. It's something that takes away from mm. your productivity. So if so in the book, I look at, um, you know, looking at the moment of crisis, the, looking at the moment of transformation, I will say that, yeah, and how in that moment, burnout rose as a new hazard, I would say, it follows in the history of such emergences. If you think about the moment of industrialization with the innovation of steam to power factories, uh, use of telegraphs mm -hmm. and all of this, uh, we had neurasthenia. Neurasthenia was called uh, an, an American disease because of all the <laughs> wondrous innovations that we had in this country that sped up business, but it also sped up work. Uh, when the light bulb lit up Paris, for instance, people had uh, dis-ease connected to having having to work longer hours precisely because you had, you had that technological innovation. You also have railway madness, for instance. Mm -hmm. So here I'm trying to put burnout in that history of transformation, or, or the movement from one economic regime or technological innovation to say at each of these moments, each of these moments reveal a specific kind of economic impulse to capture or to get at and to name what, is it, what it is that limits productivity and to then correct it. So, well, stress used to be the big thing, but now, um, more than stress, we're now talking about happiness, for instance. It's no longer, <laughs> hey, we need to get rid of stress. We need to manage stress um, and, and constantly uh, monitor ourselves, right? These wonderful Fitbit things and constantly gauging how much cholesterol <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know, nutritional uptake and all of this. Uh, but now we're like, no, forget that. What about just focusing on or being mindful, right? another big word <laughs> of, of happiness and saying, hey, Let's not focus it, focus on the negative aspects, the things that take away from us being the best that we can be. But how about uh, controlling and making better, uh, being happy, and being enthusiastic? And I don't know. <laughs> There's kind of an insoluble problem here. There's one of the one of the real forceful, um, I think, discoveries unfolding through the book. Um, which does this wonderful work just in in the field work, sort of tracking individual cases and dispositions and instances and variations on this problem. But of course, in the way the problem's just been described, it can't be solved at these individual levels, right? right? The total social fact is the problem uh, rather than its expression in any given case. So... What we're left with, you you describe as a problem of negativity, um, and the whole dynamic of sacrifice uh, that emerges from the Mausian, uh, the Mausian economy um, begins to describe what I would think of as a kind of state of irresolution. Um, you know, as we sort of find ourselves moving between individual cases uh, that give us examples of the problem. Uh, but don't give us a way to think about the problem. Yeah, that's very nicely put. <laughs> but um, you can see this in the way that in each moment of transition and technological innovation forward, right? Um, there is an attempt to um, name 
or to make visible what we should be controlling and the thing, the thing that limits further capital growth or capital expansion. So if it was fatigue and neurasthenia, well, no, it wasn't that. We didn't really fully get it. It's, it's something else. If it's not burnout, it's, it's, it's not stress, well, it's, it's happiness. And we keep going. And here, uh, contra walls, um, a little ambitious, but <laughs> as an alternative <laughs> to most, I, I am suggesting in the book that there it's not the force of the social per se, but if you were to look at each regime and the, the and the changes that then become visible, because at each moment you're saying, well, what is it to be in this moment? What is it to gain currency in this here and now, right? And how is this different from that? You're already talking about time as this thing, as history as a thing. Um, one could say that there is much more to the archive than what it can be named. You can say, hey, burnout, stress is what you can right, make visible, control, maintain, and put on a ledger, put on your Fitbit, mm -hmm. blah, 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 right? <laughs> but you know that it's not gonna solve everything because what I would argue that there is something in excess of what we can name as something to be controlled. There's something in excess of economic thinking. You can't always harness the productive potential of humanity to labor. You can't just say, hey, this is what moves you. Okay, so Stephen, this is gonna right, make you more productive and happy and healthy. So. I can make this visible, so just, just work on that, right? It, that's not going to work. So by revealing that, one could say something beyond, hey, this is the force of the social. It's not the force of social ideals. It's not history that drives people to say, hey, oh, yeah, I am a product of history. I should stop <laughs> sacrificing. The times have changed. Then, right, you're done. It's easy. But in my field work at these um, state-run rehabilitation centers for burnout, I found that clients, so they were called clients rather than patients. That's another story. <laughs> <but> <laughs> they Once they were asked to kind of step out of the shadow of being the figure of history, like, well, I thought I, I was an Asian, right? That That moment itself was already very unsettling and very uncanny and it it and it caused moments of speechlessness and self-doubt rather than agency self-authorship and you know yes rah you know <laughs> i'm gonna rise and become the worker of today it didn't cause that so that that's kind of my counterpoint to positive psychology yeah the the sort of fascinating discovery of sort of different different ways and regimes of language almost uh in which this in which this manifests itself um and the sense making i think you call it at one point uh that individuals are forced to go through to sort of understand their own larger social or economic interpolation in a system that is beyond beyond their agency i'm just say a little bit more about the speechlessness and then we'll open the floor up to speech um is speechlessness an incapacity on the part of the worker to say anything, to join the sort of social discursive space, um, or is it a refusal? Or is it maybe both in different instances? Um, that's a really interesting question. I, I saw it and I, I saw it in the book and analyzed it in the book more as a kind of a rupturing. Yeah. Um, a point at which you see or you you become aware of something else, <laughs> of this excess, right? That you are told a very reasonable story, right? Okay, you are working too much because you're probably, you know, you're, you've been told in your childhood that you should be a, a team player and you should volunteer to work over the weekend and blah, 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 right? So that, that's your story. So So let's change the narrative and you can pick up a different kind of persona, right? But then in, in talking about, and by talking and making and, and elucidating what can be done and what you have been doing right then and now and what you can be doing, 
um, people started, well, the, the clients, the clients in these rehabilitation centers that I spent time with um, revealed that that kind of didn't jive with them. There was something that there was something that chafed against these formulations. And what what was left was, yeah, you could talk about it like that, but it also unearthed a certain sense of unease, which is, well, what what was I really doing then, <laughs> right? If I am doing something and giving my time because I've been told to, that already disempowers me. So if you were to tell me that that's who you were, how am I to resurrect myself, yes. right? Yeah. It yeah. doesn't provide the impetus or the impulse to then say, well, this is me. Yeah. So the I, the capacity to say I is somehow lost, even though the narrative gains real comprehension. <laughs> 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 so that's another kind of sacrifice yeah. that I try to uh, make clear in the book, right? Yeah. There's this very open and explicit kind of sacrifice. Okay, I'm going to give you my time. But then there is a more pervasive, less announced sacrifice, which is, okay, I know this counts as a sacrifice. I know how to act. That's you giving credit to what goes, the self-evidence of the here and now, right? That's being timely. Timeliness is a form of sacrifice. Um, so if we talked about Marcel Mose, we could talk about his uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Emil Durkheim would say that, you know, the, the most valuable uh, thing the worshiper gives is God is not the blood or the fruit he offers at the altar, but his thoughts. It's the thought space that you give to what goes now. That is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I and I'm kind of listening to and listening to the silences in the rehabilitation center going, well, what if those made untimely are really the most timely people, mm -hmm. right? Because they are out of time. <laughs> Thus, they could really have a real engagement with the, the contemporary. Mm -hmm. I told you that the untimeliness would become timely. We, um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should we should open the floor to uh, to anthropologists, non anthropologists, those burned out, uh, those not burned out, uh, those stressed, overworked, underworked, uh, those speechless or or full of full of discourse. <laughs> So, uh, thank you for that conversation. You you began the conversation with a moment of like Finlandian double consciousness. The Finns looking at themselves from the perspective of Sweden. Um, and in the course of the conversation, I felt like that what was in that moment, which is a sense of nationalism, sort of dropped out. So I want you to maybe talk about nation and nationalism in this sense of what you call in the Maoistian sense both of being part of a matrix and like losing that sense of being part of a matrix. Like what's the role of nationalism waning in affect or displaced as affect? I, I just wondered if nationalism was sort of part of this for you. Definitely. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's a really good question. And that gives me the chance to talk about some ethnographic anecdotes, maybe. <laughs> so if Ben Anderson spoke about nations in terms of imagined communities, right? Well, we anthropologists might really experience, have a bodily experience of the nation. And that is to say that, well, Let's bring up another person we haven't mentioned that is kind of prominent in the book is uh, Levi Strauss. He might say there are no such things as institutions unless uh, we experience them, or not unless we we experience the reality of institutions lies in our experience of its force in our daily lives, um, and you do really feel the kind of pressure of. I don't know, giving to the commons, right? Being, giving, a, a, becoming a giver rather than a taker. It, they, so there is a still a very strong universalistic kind of an ethos, right? Uh, 
you you have depression or you have any kind of disability there, I mean so there's there's a very generous you know, social security package that you could get from the state but that also comes with a strong communal sense of are you worthy <laughs> you know are you giving you know you can get but also are you giving so that aspect of um, how the welfare state can also rent an individual asunder. It's not very prominent in maybe our American adoration of, you know, oh, the Nordic welfare state is so awesome, right? But there is a strong sense of are you, what, what kind of a citizen are you? What have you given, right? And that is felt on a communal level. And it even, man and I don't know how, uh, so let's say there are community parks and you're responsible for helping clean that park. And should you leave early, people will notice. <laughs> the next day you bump into your neighbor, you'll be like, oh, you know, uh, you were a little early. And I had no idea what she was talking about, but she had noticed me sneaking out before the <laughs> time was uh -huh. You know, so it's not, you know, the state and the the, the huge, the mechanism out there, but it's, your neighbor, it's your friend saying, well, you know, you did get that really nice scholarship down. Like, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> and friends would say that. That's what I saw and felt being there and having left 10 minutes early from the <laughs> communal <laughs> cleanup. So that's where you also feel the nation, right? What are you doing to uplift Finland from its you know, squeezed in geopolitical status between the you know, right Russia and Sweden. That that's where the nation is still there and kicking. So in a way, it sounds like the nation becomes one of the terms yeah. that gets produced as the kind of concrete shape of the community. Mm -hmm. Right. And in fact, you start with the more general problem of community and end with this problem of of this fraught problem of nation uh, in, in the Finnish case. But it's almost like the, the Mausian gift exchange has to produce a sense of community. Then you figure out what that community is. Yeah. So you can name it Finland, you can name it whatever. Right. But there must be some name of the collectivity. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, right. And that name becomes real, in a sense, mm. embodied when there is a threat, when there is a threat of an outsider, like a nosy anthropologist coming in asking, them, <laughs> is burnout a real problem? They go, oh, how dare you, like, you know, fetishize us, right? Or, or, or Sweden coming in and saying, mm, you know, your economy is not, not as good as ours or, or something like that. That's when, right, the, the naming, the, the imagined sense of we, you know, mm -hmm. this concrete sense of we, kind of might slide in with, fit in with that experience sense of, hey, we are always kind of <laughs> compared meanly to others. <laughs> so I want to, um, what a wonderful chance to be able to celebrate a wonderful book. We spend too little time celebrating the work of our colleagues. So thank you for, for yes. making the conversation possible. <laughs> uh, let me ask the sort of the obvious question, but in, in sort of two parts here, which is to think about the way in which burnout became the leitmotif of the pandemic. And I've done, you know, a lot of work and done a lot of interviews with ICU doctors and physicians who get, you know, who are leaving often. And of course, the, the diagnosis that's placed upon them is the term burnout. And I haven't found one of them who actually accepts that term. They have different ways of really thinking about, you know, what was wrong and why they're leaving or why it's so hard to be able to stay on, or some of them also why it was excruciatingly difficult, but they're even more committed than ever. So uh, the one part of the question there is, I mean, it's really asking you to maybe extrapolate between the two situations, again, obvious. Number one, did you see much rejection of the term burnout? Because at least, again, this is not a, a sample of millions, people just said that doesn't explain, this is really difficult in my experience, but that doesn't explain it. So did you see that same sort of refusal and what kinds of terms did people propose? And then also just the sort of what the journalist question, 
you know, what would you tell us that we might add <laughs> and understand what seems to be ascribed to be the phenomenon of burnout within the, the pandemic in the United States and elsewhere? Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Charles, for that. And, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is, I love this question because it allows me to kind of give more authenticity to burnout as a category, because mm -hmm. I think I started out talking about how it got downgraded. So this is a no means um, to dismiss the category, but I would also, I, you know, this but, but I would still add, yes, it is real, but also still contested. So I'm reading. Uh, for example, uh, the Netherlands, uh, they haven't adopted the term, for instance. And I think France also does not use the term burnout. They use spasmophilia instead. Um, so one of the re reasons why that might be the case, you know, why, why people are hesitant or nations are hesitant to really use the term and make use of the term might be that it's a syndrome that comes with almost 133 different uh, symptoms. And you would know more, more about this maybe than me, but, but symptomatic, that the packaging of symptoms into a recognizable syndrome itself is highly political. Um, that's one. The other one is that um, in other countries, rather than approach burnout, uh, well, Let's put it this way. Burnout is also recognized as an antecedent condition to cardiovascular disease, clinical depression, musculoskeletal disease, and you know, all the other more or Tuesday. Yeah. yeah, recognizable <laughs> primary disease categories. So other countries might just do away with burnout and just deal with the, the end ending result of burnout itself. Um but it is it is very true that people do use the term and that is to kind of it allows people to highlight maybe the horror of the workplace right to say hey i might get heart disease or i might really um uh, get depressed but if we could deal with burnout now that situation could be deferred and in that sense burnout is very um, good. <laughs> it's, it's very useful. Um, Talk about the literal Finnish version of the phrase. When is it burning to the end? Yeah. The, this, this, is, this is very much a live yeah. question. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so in Finland, uh, people often use or prefer the English word burnout, and that is because when the term got popular or gained traction in the nation, <laughs> Actually, Finnish linguists came up and had a huge national debate as to what the official translation should be in Finnish. And I think the the word that stuck was lopun palaminen, which is literally burning to the end. But then doctors said, well, that's a bit harsh. Like we don't <laughs> do we really want to call a disease that we're also giving a whole rehabilitative program to, right? Dedicating a whole program to burning to the end. Could we could we not have something a bit more neutral? And and so they came up with a more occupational health term, and that was teoupamis, which is work fatigue. Even that seemed a bit too clinical and sterile. So when I spoke to the, the clients at these rehabilitation centers, they would still use the more colorful burning to the end. Like I am burning to the end. Um, and uh, actually psychologists would use that as well. It's only in writing, in text, that they would use the official teoupamis category, which is work fatigue or work burnout. Um, I don't know if I answered you fully, but... It's a wonderful confession of the worker as a kind of wick or raw material or fuel, something to be consumed. But the journalist's question was... was... How can you help us understand oh. the sort of phenomenon? <laughs> Burnout, and why it's somehow making so many dimensions of the aftermath of the acute phase of the pandemic, 
I think should we follow the real definition of burnout, right? As this kind of imbalance in so social reciprocity, that's a great starting point from which to tease apart what everyone is doing, right? And what aspects of how we operate, what business as usual does to exacerbating the situation or ameliorating the situation. So I think, yeah, in a way, this kind of idiomatic term, burn out or burning to the end, allows for that kind of broader exploration of society and how the disease uh, grows within the matrix of sociality. So I think that that's one thing that I might highlight. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much for the great conversation. I just find this really, really exciting. I am um, in the Department of Scandinavian, and I just moved from Norway um, two months ago. And just a lot of the conversations about kind of the collectivity yeah. and soci sociality as part of the fabric of everyday life and like the social labor as like the responsibility on individuals that's very like echoing my experiences as a foreigner in Norway and how you're always visible. Like you have to take part in the cleaning of the, <laughs> otherwise you are to not um, contributing enough to the eventually the welfare state. Um, so I thought it was very interesting. And um, so my question is, I think eventually about gender. Um, so when we were, uh, when you were talking about the restructuring of um, economy in the 70s, kind of moving from more social democratic regime to a little more neoliberal orders of economy. Like one of the big forces from my, what I understood was like feminist movement so that it was framed as like a, you know, like Danish red stock movement, every, everything, employment was human rights because women were also um, wanting to take part in the employment um, market. And so I was kind of wondering how, um, and also another aspect of it might be very like bodily aspect of burnout, mm -hmm. then maybe women um, and what causes burnout at work might also be different based on your gender and also because of how our you know production and reproduction are structured, with, especially within the Nordic um, context, although um, labor participation is not equal, but yeah. And, and also from, yeah, this might be kind of like thinking out loud, but I felt like there was some sort of logics in the economy where the insertion of body and how um, like a um, body as like, um, you know, this ideal idea, ideal worker body that is able to really participate in the labor markets that can be um, disembodied and kind of um, participate in the labor at will. That to me is kind of based on this masculine idea of uh, a body that is not attached to um, certain labor, maybe reproductive labors, or um, so I was kind of wondering if there was anything. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <That's a> lot. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. I couldn't really get into a lot of the socio demographic background of you know how different groups, communities might experience burnout differently. Mm -hmm. Didn't really get into that, but they do, right? They definitely do. And what uh, the stress experts told me was that this might be similar in, in other areas, but you know, men had a tendency to, to be burnt out, but not want to come to the center <laughs> or to actually <laughs> attend these 10 day long programs. And whereas women were more likely to. Uh, and the kind of acceptability of having a mental health condition differed by gender and age and class. Um, and that, of course, shifted who, you know, shifted the demographics who would actually attend these programs. And mind you, these rehabilitation centers are in these beautiful. Finnish forests, <laughs> <laughs> the lake, and it used to house uh, World War II veterans. And as they, you know, are, are aging, as they age, uh, the welfare state thought of how they could then 
fill the beds, right? And then these more mental health and psychological conditions came to uh, take the, the space of what used to be a, how, yeah, a space for housing people with physical disabilities. Um, but yeah, um, I didn't really see a feminist movement in the in that moment of crisis and move towards the new economy per se. It wasn't framed in that way, uh, but more of an increase in sibling rivalry. Mm -hmm. And this was a word uh, that uh, a Finnish historian of labor used to describe how what used to be this kind of close association workers had with each other against the administration that shifted to sibling mm -hmm. rivalry, right? Rivalry between colleagues and this kind of more like, hey, come here, come here. <laughs> kind of approach to the executives. So that was the big kind of um, explicit problematization of how things had shifted. It was not necessarily framed in terms of a gendered feminist turn. So that might be different, or I might have missed something, but that that's not what I see. Well, there's an interesting implication there that a kind of alliance among workers then becomes another available mode of resistance. Yeah, def of definitely. definitely. There's a wonderful, there's a wonderful, mm, uh, subject, excuse me, suggestive symbolism too, in the filling of the space previously housing uh, World War II and Russo-Finnish War veterans right. uh, with current workers sort of burned out in oh, real right. time. Um, I think we are to the time. Um, so let me first of all thank Dana. <laughs> And then thank Stephen and Rebecca and Michaela and all of the talents in the Thank you, Dan. <laughs> thank you, Dan. <laughs>